Welcome back as we continue with the moon challenge. We've had some challenges of our own, but still we continue to stay home, stay safe and stay with the moon. As we come to day eight, we realize that we have reached a kind of a milestone in this challenge. The moon is almost half. For us on day eight, the moon was about 47% illuminated. So I could just as well call it a crescent moon but it's also bordering on being a half moon. This phase is called the waxing phase where the moon is growing in size apparently. If we could somehow zoom out of the earth and reach a position in space from where you could see both the moon and the earth and the whole orbit of the moon, you'll probably see the moon in one of these positions. You can see it's a very peculiar position where if the sunlight was coming from this direction, the moon would always look half to you. The phases of the moon are only apparent to us because we are looking at them from the earth as the moon goes around in its orbit. It's a matter of perspective and to us on this particular day when the new moon happened, the moon was particularly aligned with the sun and therefore Although half of it was illuminated, we were looking at the other half which was dark. Now we are looking at what is called the first quarter of the whole cycle in which we see half of the lit half and half of the darker half. That sounds strange to say but yeah that is what we are seeing. In between of course we have followed the moon from the new moon phase to this first quarter phase and you've seen how slowly the lit up side is seen more and more. This will continue into the full moon. However, after the first quarter, the portion of the moon which will be lit up, it will increase and we'll go into what is called the gibbous phase. It is notable that the angle between the position of the sun and the moon is also changing. So while on the new moon, the moon was almost in line, which means making an almost zero degree angle with the sun, it has slowly turned around to be at 90 degrees with the direction of the sun. This also reflects on the way we see it in the sky. So on this day, the moon was seen overhead when the sun was setting, which also means that both of them are rising at different times. So therefore, the moon would be rising in the east about six hours after the sun has risen. So you could actually make some notes about these kinds of facts that you find out. I will suggest that you form a table in which you can note down your experiences from the moon challenge. It could be something as simple as this in which you note down the phase day in one column. I have noted something for the new moon as you can see. Uh, you could note where you saw the moon. We didn't see the moon on the new moon day. The time I saw of course doesn't apply. And when do you expect the moon to be overhead? This is something that you would have to apply your brains for. Of course on the new moon day the moon was with the sun. So if it was to be overhead it would be overhead when the sun is overhead and that is approximately at mid-noon. However, on the first quarter, which I am calling the day 8 of this challenge, I saw the moon almost overhead, which means it was at an angle of about 90 degrees from the horizon. Of course, I also have to note down the time at which I saw it. So I saw it in the evening at around 7 p.m. I said almost overhead because it was slightly to the west and therefore it must have been overhead a little bit earlier. So I so I kind of figure out a number that maybe it would have been overhead about half an hour ago. These are very simple notes that you can make. You can of course keep adding more specifics like the exact time of sunset and sunrise that you saw alongside the moon. You could uh, add in the actual angle of the moon from either the east or the west for which you could use your hands or even a simple device made out of your protractor to measure angles. I think this will add a lot of value to the challenge that you're taking up 
and it will give you a better idea of how much different an observation is from just looking at something. Observations really contribute to scientific knowledge and this is the way in which you can better and better your observations. Always take notes. Moving on to the next slide, I have a picture of the moon shared with me by Deepak Zoshi. He has captured this almost half moon here from his backyard. In this, I tried to figure out where the sun is. And of course, it's very obvious. The sunlight is hitting the moon from this direction. And even if I do not see the sun at night, if I could figure out which way the sunlight is coming from, I know the direction of the sun. So you'll realize that the moon can even be used to find directions. Yes, it's a compass in the sky. The moon was also captured in detail by Anirudh, who has shared this beautiful picture of the day 8 crescent. Again, some lovely features on the north and the south of the moon. And let me also remind you that for the moon, this is the west. We had started with the eastern regions of the moon and we have slowly reached the central longitudes. We will slowly move on to the west, which has a lot of flat areas and a lot of interesting features. Let's take a look at the north of the moon. We remember Mare Crisium, Mare Tranquillitatis and Mare Serenitatis. These are flat lava flows on the moon which look darker than the rest of the surface and therefore they were mistaken for seas by early observers. We also have in the north the Sea of Cold. It's a largish area which is very close to the north pole of the moon. It's more like our Arctic Sea. You'll remember from yesterday the crater Aristoteles. I had forgotten to mention the other big crater close by which is called Exodus. I did mention to you the mountains though, the tops of which were visible yesterday. You can now see the whole range. These are the Caucasus Mountains and a new range has become visible, the Apennine Mountains. These are also the names of mountain ranges on the earth. Joining them is a third mountain range, the Alps. Montes Alpes is on this side and this is right at the edge where some of the taller mountains are getting lit up at the top. A new area seems to be vis uh, getting visible here at the border of Mare Serena Tatis and in that area we have two prominent craters. These are prominent more because of the contrast due to the shadows present in them and the brightly lit tall edges. Aristolus and Autolycus are these two craters which are actually quite small but right now they are quite prominent. Autolycus has an important place close to it. That is where the first unmanned landing of Luna 2 had happened. The first object ever to go from the Earth and actually touch the Moon was Luna 2 in 1959. So we've been actually on the Moon for about 60 years now. Next to this historic area, we have becoming visible a new sea, a new mare called the Mare Vaporum, the sea of vapors. It's a small mare, but it has an interesting feature. I remember it by V for vapors and V for the lunar V. This is something which amateur astronomers have found out and you can see this apparent V on the moon which is actually a few features just getting the proper sunlight and shade to form a letter. There are other letters on the moon which amateur astronomers have tried to find but this is one of the more prominent ones. If we now move to the south side of the frame, we will find the other letter, which is the lunar X. Can you see it? Maybe if I point it out to you, this is the lunar X. It's getting too much light today, so it's not that perfect an X. And this crater on this side has become visible. But of course, you can make out what I'm talking about. 
Lunar X and Lunar V come on the same day of the first quarter. So that is a day to look out for. One way to find Lunar X is to spot the craters Werner and Aliasensis. In fact, on the night of the first quarter, these craters are quite prominent and if you follow them in a line towards the north, you'll just come across the Lunar X. So it's quite easy to find and a fun activity to do. Going further north from here, we have an astronomy spatial area with the large crater Hipparchus. Hipparchus is named after the Greek astronomer and mathematician who was also responsible for the early growth of trigonometry itself. He is credited for using trigonometry in its earliest forms to find the distance between the Earth and the Moon. For astronomers though, his name is very important because he was the first person to come up with a basic star catalog. Even today, several stars in the sky are named Hipparchus something. The something is usually a number at which they appear in the catalog. Hipparchus is not just celebrated on the moon, but he also gives his name to several stars in the sky. Close to the big Hipparchus crater is a crater Horrocks. Jeremiah Horrocks was an astronomer who was the first person to actually demonstrate that the moon goes around the earth in an elliptical orbit. I think Hipparchus and others had already given this idea that the moon's orbit may not be exactly circular, but Horrocks was the first one to actually demonstrate that it is no other shape but an ellipse. We also have another crater celebrating the famous astronomer Halley. He doesn't need any introduction and in fact he has a much more important object, the comet Halley named after him. A good friend of Isaac Newton, he existed during the same times and despite Newton's big fame, Halley was able to gather his own influence in astronomy and make his own contributions. Now let's enjoy a short tour of the very feature rich southern highlands. You remember Moro Lycus, I think I had mispronounced the name yesterday. To the west of it is a large crater called Stoffler. And this one is used to find a famous crater called Faraday. Michael Faraday, who is a famous physicist with a law named after him. He's not just celebrated here, but this crater is one of the unique big craters with several overlapping craters here. So if you have a better resolution telescope, you might be able to enjoy this particular crater in all its glory. The coming days are going to bring very prominent and important features on the moon into view. So we are looking forward to day 9 and 10 when we will get to see these. While we are at it, let me remind you to keep tagging us with the hashtag moon challenge on any of your social media posts. You should also feel welcome to send us your images or experiences at cybop at gmail.com. We'll keep bringing you the current happenings from the moon challenge that we are doing with you. Stay with us and see you later.